Imagine this, you're in lab and you've just isolated a product. It's time to identify your sample. You can take a melting point, a boiling point, an IR, an NMR, even mess around with chromatography, but what if I told you you still haven't completely narrowed down your potential products? Yes, there exists one more physical property that some compounds possess, and it's what we call the rotation of plane polarized light, or optical rotation. Today, we'll tell you a bit more about this curious phenomenon and demonstrate how to exploit it via the technique known as polarimetry. To fully appreciate this technique, we'll first have to understand the chemistry that facilitates it. A chemical species rotates light depending on the arrangement of its atoms, so its stereochemistry is at play. When a compound contains a stereogenic center and its mirror image is non-superimposable, we call the pair enantiomers, from the Greek enantios, meaning opposite. It is this key stereochemical distinction that dictates the differing interactions with light. It is also why enantiomers are said to be optically active and are occasionally referred to as optical isomers. Depending on how its groups are arranged, an enantiomer can rotate light clockwise or counterclockwise from the viewpoint of the observer. If clockwise, the enantiomer is said to be dextrorotatory. If counterclockwise, it is said to be levorotatory. The terms come from the Latin words for rightward and leftward. It should be noted that though the direction of rotation is dictated by an enantiomer's S or R configuration, both S or R centers are capable of rotating to the left or right. For example, R ibuprofen rotates to the left, while R limonene rotates to the right. Additionally, different pairs of enantiomers rotate light with different magnitudes. Both the direction and the degree to which an enantiomer rotates light make up a compound's optical rotation. Pairs of enantiomers have equal and opposite rotations, so a mixture containing half the D enantiomer and half the L enantiomer has a net optical rotation of zero. This is known as a racemic mixture or a racemate. We use the technique of polarimetry to magnify this tiny, complex interaction to an observable level. Without this chemical fingerprint, enantiomers would be indistinguishable from one another. Between a pair of enantiomers, every one of their physical properties is identical. They have the same melting point, boiling point, solubility, except for optical rotation. When synthesizing stereogenic species in lab, polarimetry is crucial for a thorough analysis of the final product. And now, a demonstration of the technique. First, the sample of interest is dissolved in an appropriate solvent. For this video, about 2 grams of sucrose was dissolved in 40 milliliters of water. The solution is then transferred to the polarimeter tube by drawing up the solution into a syringe, then attaching the syringe filter and filtering the solution into the tube. The filter helps to ensure the purest sample is analyzed. When filling the polarimeter tube with solution, it is helpful to fill to the brim. If there is no access to a syringe, a pipette can also be used. When closing the tube, the excess solution's meniscus will ensure there are no air bubbles present when it is placed in the polarimeter. This is important as bubbles interfere with readings. The cover glass is slid over the top of the tube and the cap is screwed on, effectively sealing the tube. A quick inversion is performed to check for bubbles. If there are bubbles, then the previous filling step is repeated until the tube contains only solution. Before placing the tube into the polarimeter, the exterior surface is dried. Also before placement, it is helpful to wipe down both the tube and the lenses of the polarimeter with Kim wipes to remove any fingerprints or particles that may obstruct the reading. Shown here are a couple different types of polarimeters you may encounter. Once the polarimeter is loaded, be sure to close the sheath surrounding the tube. This prevents noisy background light from skewing the reading. Here's what it looks like to view the vernier scale on a typical polarimeter. As you can see, the scale is set to zero and then can be rotated freely in either direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. Again, since light is measured as rotated from the perspective of the observer, clockwise corresponds to dextrorotatory and counterclockwise to levorotatory. Perhaps the handiest skill learned from using the polarimeter is how to read a vernier scale. Instruments from many areas of science and engineering utilize the same type of scale as the polarimeter. The eponymous design was invented in 1631 by a French mathematician, and it continues to be used as an extension of accuracy when taking measurements. The vernier scale can effectively give a reading between two graduation marks, something that would otherwise have to be estimated. As you can see, the apparatus consists of two parallel adjacent scales. The top is the main scale, just like those you'd find on a regular meter stick or protractor. The bottom scale, called the vernier scale, slides freely along the fixed main scale. The measurement is taken as the point where a graduation mark from the vernier scale and a graduation mark from the main scale best align. The zero mark on the vernier scale serves as a starting point, and the mark on the main scale to which it corresponds gives a coarse reading. The aligned vernier mark represents the fractional reading and is added to the coarse reading. In the case of the polarimeters in lab, the scales are circular and read to the tenth of a degree. 
Here's an example. What's given is the image that you'd be seeing when looking into the polarimeter. The zero on the vernier scale matches up with just above 43 degrees on the outer scale, so the course reading would be 43. The graduation mark on the vernier scale that matches up best with the outer scale looks to be the seventh graduation mark, indicating a 0.7 addition. So the answer would be 43.7 degrees. Now to measure the observed rotation of a sample using the polarimeter. Looking through the eyepiece when the scale is set to zero, one side of the field of light should be darker than the other. For example, if the right side is darker, the solution is dextrorotatory and you should begin to turn the handle clockwise to match the new plane of light. The handle should be turned until both sides of the field contain an equal amount of observed light. Back to the earlier example using sucrose. As you can see, the right side of the light for the sucrose was initially darker, so the sample was dextrorotatory. It should be noted that like the case with sucrose, some species have a very small observed rotation. Consequently, this measurement clocked in at only positive 6.0 degrees. Here is some footage taken using the other type of polarimeter you may use in lab. In this case, the objective is to find the angle at which the sides and the middle of the field contain equal amounts of observed light. Before we wrap up, let's go over some calculation. Using both polarimeters, several measurements were taken and used to define an average observed rotation for the sucrose sample. This number was then plugged into the specific rotation equation using 2 decimeters for tube length and 0.05 grams per milliliter for concentration, ultimately giving a specific rotation of 64 degrees. The literature value for sucrose is 66.37 degrees when using yellow light at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Good luck with your polarimetry labs. It'll be all light.